Good versus evil, black versus white, heaven versus hell, God versus the devil. I don't know if you believe in these things, but there are many more things on this earth than we can even begin to imagine, as we will find in today's story. Now, you know what time it is, don't you? It's Friday, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. October 2009 I purchased my first house during my eighth month of pregnancy. It was located in my hometown, a small, quiet place of maybe 2,500 people who never locked their doors. It was a cute, cottage-style, two-level home I'd purchased from a guy I'd gone to high school with. It had been in his family since the place was built, yet no one could really say exactly when that was. We decided to set up the nursery in the bedroom downstairs for obvious reasons, safety and convenience. The room was painted with three walls beige and one wall a deep maroon colour. Despite the dark wall, the room was very bright and cheerful. The corner furthest away from the entrance was darker than the rest of the room. At first I thought it was because of the maroon and beige colours meeting in the corner. But, even when the sun shone directly in the room, the corner looked pitch black. I decided to put a large dresser in the corner. Ooh, it gave me chills just to look at it. I just wanted it covered up. I was a first time new mum. Everything had to be sterilized. So before moving anything in the room, I scrubbed and vacuumed the entire place. When I started to move the dresser to its assigned corner, a sharp pain ran at the bottom of my bare foot. To my astonishment, I'd stepped on a large piece of glass. The piece was thick. It looked like it came from a windshield. It even had the tempered coating. More large, thick pieces glistened along the floorboard. I moved the dresser only to find more pieces of broken glass. I couldn't believe it. I'd just thoroughly vacuumed this whole room not less than 24 hours before. If the glass was there, I would have gotten it. I checked the dresser from top to bottom, thinking the glass may have been dragged in with it. Since the glass was on the floor beneath one of the small windows, I thought maybe the window had been broken and replaced at one time. The pieces knocked loose off the sill, even though I'd washed it, when I moved the large dresser near the wall. Nothing, nothing in that room hinted at where the glass could have come from. Once again, I vacuumed the entire carpet taking great care to get the corners and along the floorboards. I finished setting the nursery up and went to make dinner. I began unpacking dishes, pots and pans, <laughs> the usual. As I squatted down to put the pots away, I happened to glance up at the glass of the oven. The reflection revealed the bottom of a late 1800 ladies' nightgown. Just as I realised what I was looking at, it felt as though someone bent over as to cover me. I felt arms wrap around my shoulders to keep me from falling back onto my rear end from the surprise. Then it felt as though whatever was bending over me fell over and went through my body. Like when a person leans too far forward and loses balance. I slowly sat fully on the floor for a long while in disbelief, stunned and confused. I was in a daze, trying to comprehend what I'd just experienced when my boyfriend came around the counter. He looked at the expression and immediately thought something had happened with the baby. He sat down on the floor with me and wrapped his arms around me, asking if I was okay. And this snapped me out of my stupor. I looked at him and told him what had just transpired. I knew that he didn't believe me. He just told me to go lay down. I must have been overtired from the move and being so close to my due date. He made dinner. We ate and went to bed. The next day, I was back in the nursery, putting baby clothes away, when I felt a searing pain go through my foot yet again. More glass. It was the same type as before, located in the same place. I couldn't believe it. 
Again, I moved all the furniture and vacuumed. I even vacuumed the window frame to make sure I got any that may have been left behind. I literally got down on my hands and knees to inspect the carpet for any remnants. Every little piece had been sucked up in the vacuum. I then called the friend I'd purchased the house from. I knew that the first floor of the house had been totally renovated in the months before the purchase, so I asked my friend if he'd had any problems with finding broken glass in the house. I made sure not to mention the bedroom specifically. There was one long pause before he responded, uh, No, I've never found any broken glass on the floor. I certainly never found any in the dark corner of the bedroom. His response sent cold electricity down my spine. Beads of fear ran down my forehead and my body stiffened like a statue. I quietly thanked him and hung up the phone. I couldn't do anything but stand there, wondering how the hell I found myself in this B-rated horror movie. November 2009 I gave birth to my beautiful daughter, Avalon, without complication. The father and I brought her home, and our new life as a family began. I would find more glass in the coming days and months. It appeared at random intervals. Sometimes I would have to vacuum several days in a row. Other times, weeks would go by without any new discoveries. Each day, I would get up before the baby and inspect every millimeter of the carpet. As time went on, I started to notice that the feeling of the room became, well, different. The darkness in the corner became stronger, emitting a sense of danger and fear. Whenever I went into the room, it felt as though the air thickened and was then sucked out. The baby didn't seem to be bothered. She was always happy no matter where she was, so I thought maybe it was just my imagination. However, it came to a point where I felt dread just walking by the room. At night, the rest of the room looked normal, with some light trickling in from street lamps. It seemed as though the light from the street and the nightlight stopped abruptly just before the corner. Fortunately, the dresser hid most of it, but I could see the edges of the abyss peeking out. January 2010 I began sleeping downstairs on the couch, so I could keep an eye and ear on the baby. Then I started sleeping on her floor. I felt as though a madness was taking over me. The fear of a dark corner driving me insane. I always felt as though something terrible was in the corner, watching, waiting, taking refuge in the darkness. Some horrible creature was living in the shadow of that goddamn corner, and it was waiting for me to let my guard down. Perhaps it was leaving the glass for me to find. Perhaps the glass was part of it, falling off as it moved around like shedding skin. I knew the glass and the corner were connected. I just couldn't piece it together. March 2011 Avalon was now 16 months old and a force of nature in her own right. Her crib, playpen, safety gates, nothing could hold her untamed character. I was mother to the princess from the movie Brave meets Dennis the Menace. <laughs> never a dull moment, never. What I couldn't understand was how she would get out of her crib each time I would try to put her down. The crib was vintage. In order to slide down it, to make it easier to pick up or lay down, I would have to reach underneath the bottom of the front panel and push a lever that released the side. It was meant to be used with my foot, sort of a hands-free feature so I could keep both hands on the baby as I laid her down. Every time I walked into her room, she would be playing happily on the floor, the side of the crib lowered. I was still finding glass on a regular basis, so... This was a big concern. By this time, the darkness had almost covered an area extending about 10 feet from the corner to the middle of the walls on either side. 
Our cats seem to agree with me about the fear and dread emanating from the corner, and refuse to go in the room even though they would always flank Avalon wherever else she was in the house. It was pretty cute watching her with two furry bodyguards. One of the cats, Kilala, was a stray that had come trick-or-treating on Halloween in 2010 and got the treat of a new home. Oh, she was a beautiful cat. Her eyes were a deep, dark green. Her soft, luxurious fur was mostly white, with patches of tiger stripes, but her face, her face was striking. Her muzzle was long and boxy, like a fox. Her ears were similar to a fox as well, long and slender with black tufts playfully sticking up at the tapered ends. Not only was she unique in looks, but her size was certainly a noticeable feature. Thirty-four inches from the tip of her nose to the tip of her tail, nineteen inches on the vertical measure. Add the extra long fur, and she was a sight to behold. After a checkup at the vet, we introduced her to our home, and then to Avalon. Key walked up to her, sat down directly to Avalon's right, and stayed there, motionless, like an Egyptian cat statue. That was her permanent post from that moment on. May 2011 My uncle had given Avalon a beautiful antique mirror, the type you would find on an old vanity table. I attached it to the wall in her bedroom so that she could make faces and admire herself as only a 16-month-old could. On cleaning day, I would hurriedly go into the room, do my chores and, well, get the hell out of there. That day, as I cleaned up the room, I dropped a toy that rolled under the crib. I had to lay down flat to reach it. As I went to pick myself up off the floor, I happened to glance in the mirror. I don't know how long I laid there on my stomach, mouth agape, completely shocked at what I saw. The reflection of the dark corner in the mirror shimmered like the surface of a lake, small ripples of shadow softly floating to the edges, tendrils of darkness floating outwards like the tentacles of an octopus floating in the ocean. If it hadn't been such a source of fear, the image would have been one of serenity and calm. I pulled myself up into a sitting position, never taking my eyes off the mirror. I couldn't, and still can't, fathom what I was looking at. My entire life has been full of experiences, yet I couldn't comprehend what I'd witnessed in that mirror. After that, my fear of the dark corner was so immense that Avalon and I both started sleeping in the living room. Me on the couch, Avi in her playpen. I couldn't go in the bedroom after dark, and barely during the day. July 2011 Avalon and I had been terribly sick for a week. It started with her vomiting uncontrollably, and then the sickness spread to me. It had gotten to the point where, despite being ill myself, I slept on the floor right next to Avalon's bed. I was terrified that she would choke on her own vomit in her sleep. I had just pulled my own head out of the hospital tub when I looked into the dark corner. The only light was coming from Avalon's small nightlight. As usual, the light stopped abruptly at the edge of the mass. But tonight, it was a bit different. More ominous and dreadful. I sat and stared at the corner until poor Avalon started puking in her sleep. Being 16 months old, she didn't have the awareness to wake herself up. I got up and brought the bucket over to her. When she was done, I emptied it, got a cold washcloth, water and fresh PJs from the dryer. I walked groggily into the bedroom and dropped everything. Avalon was out of her crib standing in front of her massive dresser with her back to me. She stood, silent, motionless, just at the edge of the light, just where the darkness started to creep and stared into the corner. I slowly walked to her. In the state of sickness we were both in, I 
knew I didn't have the strength for any bullshit that night. I picked her up. She was cold and sweaty, just as a child as sick as she was should feel. It was a relief for the moment. I washed her up, changed her clothes and bed. She was silent. I tried to give her some water. Not a sound. Even though it was late and she was sick, Avalon was never silent. The border of the darkness in the corner moved out a few more inches as I sat on the floor with her in my arms and rocked her until morning. The day after Avalon and I made it over the sickness hump, she went to her grandparents' house for the day. Being so sick for a week, things were extra messy, so I decided to clean the house. It was time to pull the dresser out to check for glass and to size up the dark shadow in the corner. I was finally getting tired of this goddamn thing, and it was time for it to go. As I yanked on the edge of the large heavy dresser, I heard a sound come straight from the piece of furniture. Like a rotting piece of wood being yanked off an old nail. Sort of half screech, half groan, but the dresser held fast. I stepped back to assess the situation. I stared hard at the corner letting it know that I wasn't going to be deterred. I straightened my back, braced my feet and proceeded to move that damn dresser. The noise started low and gained volume as I pulled the dresser away from the alcove. It crescendoed into an almost a scream of unimaginable horror as I finally got the large piece of furniture away from the wall and into the middle of the room. And then, deafening silence. The corner, it seemed, sat, contemplative. I felt silly, staring down at a shadow that really hadn't done anything except instill fear, sickness and disbelief into my soul. For a moment, it just looked like a bright, sunny room with no ominous overtones. I stood there, wondering if I'd really imagined it all. As I was lost in thought, a twinkle of light caught my eye. It was another piece of glass. It was stuck halfway under the trim board. It was different from the previous pieces found. It was larger, had sharper edges, looked like a piece of volcanic glass. I turned the piece over in my fingers. As I turned to leave the room to add the piece to the collection, a pain shot up the back of my leg. Another black piece had found its way under the ball of my foot. I pulled it out, added it to the first piece and began the short walk to the kitchen. Once again, pain. Another piece of black shiny glass. It seemed that every step I took, another piece of glass appeared just beneath my foot. I stood there scanning the floor for more pieces, yet the beige carpet was bare. Having been vacuumed each morning, there was little dust, dirt, or any other debris inhabiting the fibers. I slowly took another step, trying to see if anything would miraculously appear under my foot. As soon as my entire foot was placed on the floor, more pain. A piece of glass appeared only after I had completed each step. In very ungraceful-like manner, I made my way the eight feet left to the door into the kitchen and grabbed the vacuum again. After doing the daily ritual of vacuuming the entire house, I once again entered the room. I stood in front of the corner, squaring off with it. I spoke to it out loud, as if it had been something living. Surely it would hear me. Whatever the fuck you are, you need to leave me and my family alone. You are not welcome here. I don't want you messing with Avalon, Dave, or myself. If you make us sick again or hurt us in any way, I will burn down heaven and hell in order to make you suffer. And at this point, it wasn't an empty threat. Once crossed, I don't take kindly to letting things go. Hurt anyone I care about, well, it may take years, decades, but I will have my revenge. 
I moved the dresser to another point in the room. I wanted the corner opened in order to keep a closer eye on it. The noise I made when I moved the... it made me feel as though the shadow felt safer hiding behind something. I vacuumed again and went to the library to do some research. I spent hours trying to find anything about the entity in the corner. I couldn't find anything about dark spots and or glass. I researched the history of the house and of limestone, trying to find the lady in white. Nothing. Nothing. I went home, defeated. I walked into the house, around the corner, into the kitchen, and stopped at Avalon's bedroom door. I looked at the corner. I will find a way to get rid of you, destroy you, and get my house back, you son of a bitch. I continued upstairs and sat on the top step, something I did when I needed to think or get a moment of peace. As I sat in thought, I felt a cold wind come from the opposite side of the room. The hair on the back of my neck and arms stood up. The pages of a magazine sitting on the floor near the bed fluttered. I looked around and saw nothing. The cats, who had been napping on the bed, shot up and ran downstairs. Kilala nuzzled my arm and climbed into my lap. I could still feel the cold swirl around us. She sat rigid, on my legs in her usual Egyptian cat stance, ears scanning independently like little furry radars. She turned her head to look at the windows on the either side of the room. She scanned the area until both eyes and ears locked onto something. Her eyes followed it across the room, arched behind me, and then stopped. At that moment, the air was so cold I could see my breath. Something ran fingers through my ponytail and tugged at the back of my shirt. But I wasn't scared. Key wasn't freaking out just observing. I sat staring dead ahead, pun intended. I tried to see out of the corner of my eye to catch something in the periphery of my sight. I looked to my left as much as possible, only to catch the lace and ruffles of a familiar dress. It was the lady in the white dress from the kitchen. Not daring to move, I looked up to catch a glimpse of her entire form. I could see as far up as her waist. That was all there was of her for me to see. She stepped down onto the staircase, and by her second step, she was gone. Key's eyes followed her the rest of the way down the stairs and into the kitchen, right up to the spot where I had first encountered her. She then turned back to me and did her usual head bump and began to purr. We sat on the stairs. Her sprawled in my lap, me rubbing her ears and tummy. September 2011 I tried to figure out what I was missing. Was the corner and the lady in the white dress connected? Did something happen to her in that room? Was she murdered and left in the corner? The only thing I could think that may help was to smudge the house with sage. <laughs> it couldn't hurt, could it? It was better than doing nothing at all. The only problem? Living in northern Maine doesn't allow for many specialty stops. That weekend, I made the four-hour journey to a small shop in Augusta after speaking with a very helpful gentleman that owned it. Merkabasol was the usual little hippie, metaphysical Tibetan supply shop that had shelves of crystals, tarot cards, Tibetan prayer flags, hemp clothes, and the like. After almost an hour of explaining my plight, receiving suggestions and instructions, I left with a large feather and a smudge stick. For those that don't know what that is, it's a cigar-shaped bundle consisting of white sage, sometimes lavender, and other cleansing plants. The feather is to direct the smoke as needed. The next day I brought Avalon back to my parents' house, waited for Dave to go to work, and began the sweep. 
I started upstairs. As instructed, I smudged the windows and windowsills, the door frames, and, for good measure, the entire damn room. I went room to room until the entire house was done. A smoky haze filled the air and the smell of sage was overpowering. I got to Avalon's bedroom. I did the windows and the door leading out to the mudroom. The closet was next, and then the damn corner. Gee, that damn corner. I stood there, stick in one hand, feather in the other, squaring off like a showdown in an old western. I blew on the stick to get as much smoke as possible billowing out of it and went to work. I started in the direct middle of the dark spot, concentrating as much smoke as possible into it. The spot lightened, but the edges stayed dark. I pulled back, and the spot became dark again. I tried it again, pulling as much smoke as possible from the bundle and directing it towards the center of the shadow. Only this time I gave it everything I had. I kept the barrage of smoke going as long as I could, the shadow beginning to fade from the center out to the edges. About an hour later, the shadow was gone completely. The entire room, bright and sunny. I thought maybe this had done the trick, but I still had the feeling of dread and fear. I finished smoking out the entire house, I opened all the windows to let the bad spirits out as instructed. Nothing felt different. No shadows throwing themselves out to get away from the cleansing smoke. No white lady appearing then disappearing with a thankful look of calmness to let me know she was able to leave this world. Nothing. Nothing but my neighbor walking up the driveway with a small bundle of fur in her arms. Before I'd begun the smudging, I put our cats outside. I saw them on the lawn giving me dirty looks through the upstairs windows. I'd woken them from a deep slumber, and they were not ready for their usual evening prowling. Smokey had continued his nap under some pine trees. Key wasn't far away, sitting in her guard cat position. Doom Kitty, from the show Ruby Gloom, went off to his usual visit for treats from the elderly couple nearby. After the smudging process, I saw them again as I opened windows. They'd never moved from their selected spots. From the time it took for me to walk down my very tiny staircase, across the kitchen and out the front door, my dear, sweet, brave little Kilala had died. My elderly neighbor found her laying by the tree she was sitting at moments before, Smokey and Doom meowing loudly next to her. She knew the cats very well, just seeing Key in any position but her Egyptian cat guard pose was enough to raise concern. She picked her up and brought it to me as I walked out the door. For a moment I thought, oh no, Key got hit by a car. But when the neighbor explained to me what happened, all I could think of was, this is war. The cause of death was acute respiratory failure and myocardial infarction. She suffocated and had a heart attack at the same time. The vet just couldn't understand why a year-old cat that she deemed healthy less than three weeks prior could just die suddenly. A heart attack, yes, it is possible in animals, and yes, it could happen just like that. However, it was usually brought about by excessive adrenaline. Both the neighbor and I had seen Key sitting under a tree just moments before her death. Not terrified in fear, or running crazily around the yard. Just sitting there, doing what she did best. And what about the suffocation? The vet shook her head, looked over her notes, re-read the lab results. How could an animal suffocate with no obstructions in her breathing passages? No medical issues to speak of. Nothing. Nothing. There was so much nothing going on. I felt like I was in the never-ending stories. <laughs> Apologies for that. I'm the type to make bad jokes at funerals. I guess it's a coping mechanism. January 2012. It was back to the library for more research. 
I looked up shamanic recipes for cleansing the soul. Spirit animals, spirit stones, spirit flowers, crystals for cleaning chakras, binaural beats, meditation music, Gregorian chants, African drum beats, candle colors, prayers in every language and religion. I found every possible bit of information regarding cleansing that was available. I filled a notebook with what I thought I may need, made my list of weapons, and headed back to Augusta. I came home with an arsenal. Spent about a week familiarizing myself with each and every rock, plant, prayer, chant, and color that I'd purchased. When I felt I was ready, I made sure that Dave and Avalon would be out of the house for at least the weekend. This was something I needed to do alone. Dave was a disbeliever, and I didn't want anything else bad to happen to Avalon. Seeing her sick was enough for me. The two remaining cats went to a friend's house. I didn't know if having everyone as far away as possible would protect them, but I had to try. Finding myself alone in the house again, I set about constructing an altar of sorts in the corner. White candles lined the walls. Incense in the smudge stick sat in the middle. Various crystal stones were strewn about. A bowl of holy water to my right. Anathemy to my left. I laid out the prayers and incantations in front of me and went to work. As I sat down, I felt silly again. I looked about the items and wondered if I'd really just let my imagination get the best of me. I sat eyes closed, and thought about all the previous experience I'd had throughout my entire life. After a few minutes, my resolve strengthened, and I knew the instinctual feelings swirling about my innards were correct, and that this had to be done. I poured a circle of salt around the altar. This was to create a circle of protection. I sprinkled holy water over everything. Lit the white candles, incense and smudge stick. Positioned the crystals in a semicircle. Sat cross-legged and began the first protection prayer. As I spoke the words out loud, I heard a faint screeching sound. Like car tires coming from down the street. It grew louder as I spoke more of the prayer. Like when I tore the dresser from the wall, it turned into a howling roar. I continued the praying as a cold breeze picked and swirled around me. The howling became echoish, like it was coming from an old-time radio. I kept my eyes closed and the words going. I was terrified inside, but I couldn't let it surface. I can laugh a bit about it now, but it was almost like the Ark opening scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. I kept my posture rigid, head up, back straight, legs crossed hands on my knees. I was coming to the end of the prayer, and I knew I would have to open my eyes to read the next set of notes. In hindsight, I probably should have memorized everything. But when your house kills your cat, the small details are easily overlooked. I finished the prayer, and the howling started to die down, and the breeze warmed. I knew I couldn't stop, or else something worse might happen. Too terrified to open my eyes, I felt around for the vial of holy water, sprinkled everything around me again and began the only prayer I knew somewhat by heart, the Lord's Prayer. I spoke loudly and angrily, corralling all the negative energy and events that had happened so far. I used the negativity to my advantage. As I spoke, my tone was as threatening as possible. I used the prayer as bullets. I finished the prayer, opened the vial again, and splashed the entire thing at the wall. Then I began the prayer again. Speaking as though I was in a fight and throwing insults, I kept the thoughts of the past circulating in my head, using them as fuel to get myself worked into a murderous frenzy. I wanted to make the fear dissipate altogether. I wanted whatever it was in that corner to fear me as I had feared it. I was screaming by now just repeating the Lord's Prayer over and over. I couldn't hear the howling over my own voice. The anger inside numbed me to the cold breeze. I just kept going, raising to my feet, clenching my fists, screaming at the top of my lungs. 
The entire time, my eyes were closed. Images of the dark corner shone brightly behind my eyelids. The shadow kept contorting, like looking into a sadistic kaleidoscope. I don't know how much time had passed before I finally fell to my knees, exhausted. I slowly opened my eyes to see the shadow in the corner. It was about the size of a dessert plate, edges pulsating in a starburst. This made me as angry as ever before. Hatred and revenge swelled up in me. I was literally so mad, I didn't know what to do. I looked around at my arsenal. The holy water was depleted. Candles burned down. Incense long gone. Knowing I didn't have much time before the shadow began regaining its own strength and exacting revenge as before, I ran upstairs, grabbed a small Bible I'd gotten when in basic training, ran back to the corner and placed the Bible on the wall. A small moan shook the room. Leaning the book against the wall, I ran back to the kitchen, grabbed a roll of duct tape, went back into the bedroom and taped the Bible right over the center of the shadow. When you're short on time, you got to do what you got to do. I ran out to my truck, tore out of the driveway, spitting rocks and squealing tires. I got to the grocery store, bought as many one-gallon waters as I could carry, threw them into the truck and tore off to the church. The priest met me with concern. I must have looked like a crazy person, arms full of gallon jugs, eyes wide, face red, carrying on about how I needed him to bless me and the water. Since I'd spoken to him before about my predicament, I was able to quickly give him the short explanation. He had refused to come bless the house before, thinking me overly dramatic. It was probably for the best anyway. God knows what revenge would have been exacted on my family for that. Telling him that I would return to explain every little detail as soon as I could, I begged for him to fulfill my request of blessings. He said his little prayers, motioned with his hands, and was done with this crazy woman in his church. I pulled into the yard sideways, snow, rocks, and dirt flying, and ran into the house. I hadn't even bothered to close the doors when I left. I stopped inside the front door. It was as though time had slowed down. The house creaked and groaned. I stood and listened for a minute. It almost felt like I was an old ship at sea. The floor seemed to rise and fall, as though the waves were slowly rocking the house back and forth. I finally lost my shit, I thought out loud. I'm on the crazy boat to hell. I watched the pictures on the wall for movement. Fortunately, they stayed still. Nothing in the house seemed to be pitching back and forth, as if it were really on a boat, and yet, the floor felt like it was swaying back and forth. I tried to walk into the bedroom. It was like walking along the floor in a funhouse, on top of boards that shifted back and forth or up and down, trying to throw kids off balance. The floor didn't move. It was my perception of the floor that was throwing me off. I held tight to the water jugs and made my way into the bedroom. The Bible was still taped to the wall, edges of shadow poking around it. I tore it off the wall, opened a jug of water and began pouring the entire thing down the corner and along the walls. The ship stopped swaying. I picked up the second jug in one hand, opened the Bible with the other. Not knowing where to start, I turned to the first page of Genesis and began to read. At this moment, I had no plan. I was going on some sort of primal instinct. The Lord's Prayer and Holy Water seemed to work the best, so I stuck with this form of battle. As I read about what God did on the seventh day, I poured water in the corner and along the walls. The ship tilted sharply to starboard, and I almost lost my balance. But I kept reading. The howling and chilly breeze started again, so I closed my eyes and began letting myself get angry again. I kept reading, kept getting angrier and angrier. This thing had made my daughter sick, killed my cat, and made me live in fear. It had pushed me too far, and now it was my turn. 
I felt the hatred, anger, and revenge spring up from my soul once again. I worked myself into a frenzy of screaming words from the Bible and pouring water into my hand to whip it at the walls. The ship pitched starboard and then to port. I struggled to keep my balance. I think the only thing that kept me upright was knowing that it was a matter of perception. I knew the shadow was messing with me. The house stayed still. The crazy boat was sailing. I kept reading, kept splashing, but I was getting weak. Now it was a matter of who would outlast the other. I threw the book on the floor, poured water into both hands and started painting the corner with it. Some sick, twisted form of finger painting. The walls were freezing, like sticking my hands onto a metal bar in the freezer. When my hands hit the wall, a wail of anger thundered through the house. Still screaming, I spoke of God getting rid of the beast and protecting my family. I felt like an evangelist going under the power. I repeated this over and over, again losing track of time. Just when I thought I couldn't do any more, I gained a second wind and kept going. The shadow would spread out across the walls, shrink into nothing, spread out again, shrink again. By this time I was shouting profanities, telling it to get out of my house and praying. The walls, floor, and myself were all soaked with holy water. I knew I couldn't stop until this thing was gone for good. My family and I were in big trouble if I didn't. I had one last idea. I ran to my jewelry box and grabbed an old rosary and cross. They belonged to my grandmother and had been blessed so many times and Jesus himself knew the objects well. Back in the bedroom, I hung the cross up on a little nail in the same spot I'd taped the Bible. Now that I think about it, why was that little nail in the exact spot I needed it to be? Had it been there all along? I really don't remember. I wrapped the rosary around my wrist, grabbed another jug of water and the now soaking pages of the Bible, and started again. I never let the anger waver or the fear surface. I just let myself be mad, taking every frustration out on that damn shadow. The ship still listed back and forth. The house creaked and groaned. I stumbled a few times, but never fell. I kept going like a marathon runner. In one last stand, the shadow swallowed the corner and adjacent walls in mind-altering blackness. The howling neared a glass-breaking pitch, and the house felt like it was going to cave in on me. Still screaming, I was down on my knees, hands planted on the floor. Yes, I was still on the crazy boat. Everything swayed and swirled around me. I felt myself faltering. And then, silence. Once again, nothing. I couldn't do anything more. So I laid down and either passed out or just fell asleep. I awoke. I didn't know if hours, days, or just seconds had passed by. Everything was still, quiet. I could hear birds, cars, kids playing outside. I sat up. The room was a mess. Empty water jugs all over. Candles, gemstones. Notebook pages were splayed all over the floor. The Bible was on the floor next to me. The rosary still around my wrist and the cross was up on the wall. I stared at it for a moment. Had I gotten rid of the shadow? The prior events came into mind and I stood up quickly, trying to figure out a new game plan. My thoughts raced as to what I should do next. I grabbed the Bible and a half full jug of holy water. As I went to start my siege once again, I noticed a flutter of white. Out of the corner of my eye, just outside the door of the bedroom, was the bottom corner of a white lace dress. I turned to look at it straight on, but it disappeared. I turned back to throw water into the corner, but paused. 
The corner was light. The whole room had a sunny glow to it. There was no feeling of dread, fear, or hatred. I even felt happy. Not sure what to do, I cleaned up the bedroom, left the cross and rosary hanging on the wall, and went to get my family. March 2012 We moved out of the little house. Business transfer. Funny thing is, I never put in for one. Was something trying to get rid of me? My pay was doubled, and I couldn't say no to the perks. I almost hated leaving the house. I still own it, and people have rented it without incident. The cross and rosary are still hanging in the corner. I've told my renters that they were free to remove it, but I'm told that it makes them feel secure. Perhaps it all really wasn't my imagination. So um, the uh, eagle-eared among you will have noticed that that is a story I did a while ago, back in uh, the summer of 2018, but it just wasn't quite right. Didn't quite nail it as I would have liked to. Some glitches in the vocal, uh, the vocal was too low in the mix, and uh, I wanted to add some more sound effects and generally improve the quality of the video. Plus it was a multi-parter, which people don't tend to like as much as single standalone videos. So. Here it is, remastered in one full part. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, back again very soon. Second week here in the Netherlands and all is still going well. As well as could be hoped. <laughs> anyway, that's enough for me for one week. Okay, vel to rusten. See you next week. Bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?